Hey, listeners out there, welcome back for another week of the Brainwaves Podcast, a podcast about neurology and medicine and all the fascinating science and history that come along with it. I'm Jim Siegler, your host, and this week we'll be spending the next, oh, about 20 minutes or so reviewing the fungal infections of the brain. Because there's more to it than what I typically think about in my own practice of vascular neurology. More to it than just strokes due to cryptococcal vasculitis or aspergillosis, which are pretty much the only times that I think about fungi. Very rare conditions, but all fungal CNS disease is pretty rare anyway. And in preparing for this week's show, I really learned a lot about how our understanding of fungal neurologic diseases has evolved over time and the progress that we've made in recognizing and treating these conditions as the worldwide incidence of fungal brain infections actually continues to rise, which is what we're going to dive into in a few minutes. And by the time the show's over, I think that you'll have learned something new about this topic, unless you happen to be a neuroinfectious disease expert. If you are an expert, then this show may be just a waste of your time, and you should probably listen to one of our other great shows, maybe the show about ALS and the U.S. military or something. But today, we're going to be talking about fungi, so let's get to it. I thought about reviewing this particular topic because this month, September 2018, marks the six-year anniversary of one of the most impressive fungal outbreaks in American history. The growing outbreak of meningitis tonight contracted through that common remedy for back pain, steroid shots in the spine. Today we learned to stop using a steroid from a specialty pharmacy that's been linked to a deadly nationwide fungal meningitis outbreak. Especially headache, neck pain, vomiting, uh, dizziness. um. Millions of Americans get these steroid shots for back pain every year. And today, the fear is of tainted injections. Well, Donna, state health officials aren't saying where these two reported cases were diagnosed, but they say that hundreds of people across the state might have been exposed to those defective steroid uses, and they're asking everyone to be vigilant. An unprecedented outbreak. We don't really see a lot of fungal outbreaks. Outbreaks are almost always due to some kind of bacterial food poisoning, like salmonella or E. coli. Or it's a neurotropic virus, like Zika or West Nile. And we've talked about each of these kinds of outbreaks in prior shows. So not often do we hear about fungal disease. Anyway... Six years ago, we had one. The result of those steroid shots to the spine for patients seeking relief from back pain. Now, new cases have been reported. You may remember hearing about this on the news. The first patient was a 56-year-old man who presented with subacute headache, malaise, and he was found to have a neutrophilic pleocytosis on CSF testing. Now, this guy was a previously healthy, immunocompetent patient, and it was thought that he just had a run-of-the-mill bacterial meningitis, which is still pretty serious. He was treated with antibiotics, but he did not get any better. In fact, he got sicker and sicker. It'd be another two weeks after his admission before CSF cultures actually identified the causative agent, aspergillus. Upon hearing this news, Dr. April Petit, an ID specialist at Vanderbilt, she probed deeper into the patient's history. She learned that 46 days earlier, the guy had received a routine epidural corticosteroid injection. So she reported this to the Tennessee State Health Department, where an investigation was quickly initiated. The next steps for this kind of exposure were for the CDC to investigate the clinic responsible for the procedure, and then recall and test all steroids that were bottled and distributed by the New England Compounding Center, the NECC. This is where the suspected contaminant originated. And the intervention was swift. But, as an interesting plot twist, when the FDA recalled all the steroid preparations from the NECC, they didn't just find samples were contaminated with aspergillus. Over a dozen other bacterial species were isolated, and five additional fungal species besides the aspergillus. In fact, the most commonly isolated fungus from the outbreak was Exorohylum rostratum a soil-based organism that's almost never been seen in human infections. The FDA released a MedWatch safety alert in October 2012, just two to three weeks later, stating that any patient who had received a corticosteroid drug from the NACC, whether it was used for epidural steroid injections, eye surgery, or any other procedures, those patients should be identified and tested for the exposure 
It was a massive undertaking. Over 13,000 patients were thought to have been exposed to NECC bottled compounds between May and September of 2012. Luckily, only 6% of all potentially exposed patients actually became symptomatic. And this may seem like a small number, but that meant that over 750 people across 23 states were unintentionally harmed, and 61 patients, 8%, died as a result of this. Now, acquiring a fungal central nervous system disease like this from an epidural steroid injection if you're a healthy person, it's not what you're likely to encounter on a day-to-day basis in the hospital. It's usually some post-neurosurgical case, somebody who's on chronic steroids, or who's had a recent organ transplant, or a transplant with allogeneic stem cells. One feature about fungal meningitis that you probably know, but you may not have thought about necessarily, is that it is really the only class of CNS infections that's not communicable from person to person. You're not going to get it by sitting in the same room or sharing a glass of lemonade with somebody who also has CNS aspergillosis. For other types of CNS infections, you do have to worry about transmissibility and contact precautions. Before the advent of the meningococcal vaccine in the late 70s, among military personnel and college students, Neisseria meningitidis could spread from student to student over a matter of days or weeks, potentially infecting dozens at a time. Among viruses, the herpes virus pours itself out from open sores in the oral mucosa, and influenza from your respiratory secretions. And Zika, which doesn't spread directly from person to person, leverages the flight patterns and the bloodthirsty proboscis of 80s mosquitoes in order to find new hosts. Cryptococcus doesn't do this. Histo won't do this. You need open brain surgery, or you have to have a mechanical heart valve to develop an aspergilloma brain abscess if the patient's immunocompetent, or you need an earthquake to aerosolize the ground-based coccidioides spores and infect the lungs of Californian patients. There's actually a great paper on these little microepidemics that are associated with natural disasters by Benedict and Park, which I've referenced in the show notes. You should check it out, as long as you're not somebody who's going to panic after every thunderstorm or tornado. More often than not, when you find somebody who has a fungal CNS infection, or at least you suspect it, it's because the patient is neutropenic or lymphopenic. The patient has acute leukemia, or uncontrolled HIV, or they've been on prolonged immunosuppression with corticosteroids or chemotherapy. In spontaneous cases of CNS infection, and by spontaneous I mean patients who aren't exposed to fungi through neurosurgery or IV drugs or other contaminated devices like epidural needles, these spontaneous cases are most commonly due to aspergillus. Overall, aspergillus is the most common fungal infection you're likely to encounter in the average patient. Usually, aspergillus reaches the central nervous system via hematogenous spread from the lungs, or less often through the sinuses. On neuroimaging, which you'll definitely be getting before a lumbar puncture, in any patient with a suspected CNS mass or immunocompromised state, most patients will have a focal brain abscess or an aspergilloma, maybe even a few aspergillomas. On MRI, these characteristically have a ring-enhancing appearance, usually with a lot of vasogenic edema, kind of like a metastasis. And some centers will use MR spectroscopy to distinguish abscesses from metastases, and the classic findings in an abscess will be an increased lactate and succinate peak, whereas METs often show a higher choline peak. Sometimes, patients with aspergillus can also develop a cerebral infarction, secondary to mycotic emboli from the heart, or they can even develop subarachnoid hemorrhage due to mycotic aneurysms. Moving on to another fungal form, mucor mycosis also likes to spread hematogenously. But in severe diabetics and patients who are immunocompromised, sinus invasion is also not uncommon. Like aspergillus, abscess is more likely to occur with mucor rather than meningitis or encephalitis. Contrast this with cryptococcal CNS disease, which commonly presents in immunocompromised patients with a meningoencephalitis. The presentation of a patient with crypto is classically subacute, especially in the setting of lymphopenia, where you usually see it. The immune system just hasn't been able to mount a response to the infection and inflame the brain. In fact, only half of patients with HIV and cryptococcal meningitis ever present with neck stiffness or nuchal rigidity. Many untreated HIV patients may be entirely asymptomatic, 
only to develop headache and focal deficits with treatment of the HIV and immune reconstitution. Like most fungal infections, cryptococcus spreads from the lungs via the bloodstream to the brain and can rarely form cryptococcomas in addition to meningitis. A critical feature about cryptomeningitis is the intracranial hypertension. With meningeal involvement by crypto, as many as 1 in 10 patients can develop a communicating hydrocephalus, which can be life-threatening. And for this reason, many treated patients undergo serial large-volume LPs to remove excess fluid. Additionally, on MRI, patients with cryptococcus may have scattered microabscesses, less than 3 millimeters or so. And these may be difficult to distinguish from candidiasis or miliary TB. I know it seems like a lot of memorization at this point, and for those of you who are taking your board exams, there are a couple of other buzzwords and relationships which should make you think about particular fungi, like premature neonates and candida meningoencephalitis, skull base infections and aspergillus, diabetes and iron overload with invasive rhinocerebral mucor or rhizopus, IV drug use and candidiasis, and of course HIV and cryptococcus neoformans. Then there are the geographic considerations. Coccidioides in the southwestern U.S., Histo in the Midwest and Southeast U.S., as well as South America and Sub-Saharan Africa, and blastomycosis in the Ohio River Valley, the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast U.S. Kind of boring to have to memorize, but I can at least acknowledge these things on a podcast about fungal brain disease. Diagnosing one or the other of these pathogens, it's not all that different. Except for the cryptococcal antigen and sometimes aspergillus, most of these species are going to be identified using fungal cultures, the gold standard. And this process can take a few weeks, maybe even delaying the diagnosis. So if a fungal meningitis is suspected, experts recommend rapid and empiric treatment with targeted antifungals. Here's a good place for me to pause and to remind you all that the Brainwaves podcast is just for fun. Kind of like listening to a book with music and sound effects and stuff. And you shouldn't use anything discussed on the program for medical decision making. But seriously, how do experts go about diagnosing and differentiating the various CNS fungal infections? CSF is often abnormal, and hypoglycorrhachia, or low CSF glucose, is one of the pathognomonic features of fungal meningoencephalitis. You really only see this in conditions like fungal infections, carcinomatous meningitis, and TB. So it's always a bad sign. Take a listen to episode 49 on the podcast to hear more about CSF analysis. In addition to the hypoglycorrhachia, you might find a neutrophilic or lymphocytic pleocytosis, but usually not RBCs. A high opening pressure, like more than 35 or 40 millimeters of mercury, is pretty common among patients with crypto, which is again why these patients often require serial taps. Canada species, like cryptococcus, usually cause a meningoencephalitis, although abscesses, ventriculitis, and vasculitis cases have also been described. Candida, as you may remember, is a natural component of your mouth, your gut, and the vaginal flora. So in patients who have intact immune systems, it's a normal finding on the human body. But not in the brain. Classically, you're going to see candida meningitis in premature neonates, given the fact that it colonizes the vaginal wall. But you also see it in organ transplant recipients and IV drug users. A distinguishing feature of candida infections is that disseminated candidiasis should be suspected in patients who have these classically erythematous rashes of the skin folds, like armpits and the groin, and under breast tissue, where the skin is difficult to keep dry. In addition to these clinical and initial laboratory findings, imaging may show pachymeningeal or leptomeningeal enhancement when there's subarachnoid involvement, or frank abscesses in cases of aspergillosis, mucor, histo, and blasto. Like I said before, the gold standard for diagnosing a fungal meningitis is CSF culture, which can take up to three weeks to return positive. But for patients who have an encapsulated abscess, they can have normal or negative CSF data, So don't let that fool you. Cryptococcus and coccidioides have established antigen-based immunoassays, and the galactomannan assay can help you identify aspergillosis, 
But antigen assays are still being investigated for some of the other less common fungi, like blasto and histo. Nonspecific ELISAs for fungal wall components, like beta-D-glucan, can be useful sometimes, but false negative results can lead you to a misdiagnosis of crypto and mucor. PCR-based assays and the metagenomic next-generation sequencing of CSF may facilitate the diagnosis of unusual pathogens, as in cases of idiopathic recurrent or chronic meningitis, and these techniques are fast becoming a standard practice at most academic centers. So check with your ID specialists about what the most up-to-date methods are for diagnosing CNS infections. Moving on to treatment. Thankfully, antimicrobial selection is not as complex for fungal CNS disease as it is for bacterial diseases. We just don't have as many options to offer these patients. In aspergillus, really we only have voriconazole, which is the drug of choice, or lipid-encapsulated amphotericin B, which is the second choice. Cryptococcal meningoencephalitis is optimally treated by a combination of liposomal ampho and flucytosine. This is followed by a long course of fluconazole. Many CNS fungal infections are ultimately treated with a protracted course of an azole following an initial powerful antifungal drug, and the IDSA has specific guidelines on choice and duration of therapy that you should refer to. Canada species can be treated with ampho, plus or minus flucytosine, just like crypto. In addition to the targeted antifungals, some patients can require surgical intervention, like cases where there's a large abscess with mass effect or hydrocephalus, or the patient has refractory disease. And it kind of goes without saying, but with any of these treatments, it's important to address the underlying cause. Is your patient immunocompromised? Is there anything that we can do to correct it? Do they have HIV? Are we worried about immune reconstitution syndrome? And regarding the antimicrobial treatment, I want to talk about drug resistance. Kind of a hot topic. And it's a major concern among infectious disease specialists and public health officials. As you're aware, antimicrobial resistance is a huge problem. Like a greenhouse gas kind of problem. Not just a problem in the hospital when you're treating an older woman with a bladder infection that happens to be resistant to two or three common antibiotics. But also on a more global scale with the use of antibiotics in food production where farmers have found that antibiotic prophylaxis actually makes for larger, healthier pigs and chickens and cattle. More money in their pocket. And more meat on the table for you and me. Now, this ship has already sailed. I don't think our government is planning on addressing this anytime soon. But importantly, let's talk about how this affects patients with fungal infections. How is this any different, or is it any different at all? than bacterial antibiotic resistance. Here's the thing. Unlike bacteria, for which we have dozens of different antibiotics, there are only a handful of drugs that are effective against fungi. Aspergillus, from the 2012 outbreak, and again, the most common fungal pathogen in neutropenic patients with meningitis, it's really only treated with one or two drugs, voriconazole or amphotericin. What are we gonna do when these drugs don't work? I don't mean to scare you or anything, but when that day comes, it's going to be terrifying. As an intern, I remember my first patient who came in with an extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing organism. Not a single antibiotic in the known pharmacopoeia could treat it. The infection was unaffected by the cephalosporins, the penicillin classes, even meropenem and carbapenem did nothing. It was a train barreling down the tracks at 100 miles an hour. Nothing could stop it. I remember on lunch breaks, my co-residents and I joking about putting up a brick wall and quarantining that patient's room after she died. At the time, we didn't even know if bleach could sufficiently rid the room of the pathogen. And I don't mean to make light of this patient. It was a really sad and horrifying case. But again, that bug she had gradually developed resistance to drug after drug after drug. 10 or 12 antibiotics... With aspergillus, we don't have 10 or 12 drugs. We have two. The index patient for the 2012 aspergillus outbreak ultimately passed away from his disease as well. Fungal infections of the central nervous system, regardless of one's immunocompetency, are highly fatal 
disaster in decades. Of the more than 750 infected patients from that 2012 outbreak, 8% died. A settlement was reached that would provide $100 million to the victims of a nationwide meningitis outbreak that was linked Which is actually less than what we see in patients with fungal abscesses and immunocompromised patients. Mortality rates in fungal brain disease can be 80 to 100 percent in those patients. Among survivors, the prognosis is also unsettling. You can imagine that patient outcomes are going to depend on the root cause of the abscess. A first-time IV drug user who develops a Canada abscess may do okay with appropriate treatment and substance abuse counseling. But a patient who has uncontrolled HIV, who develops recurrent cryptococcal meningoencephalitis, that patient may not do as well. While fungal brain abscesses are identified in only about 1% of all solid organ transplant recipients, 5% for allogeneic stem cell recipients, most patients who develop this complication die of their disease. According to one case series involving 1,600 patients who were transplanted at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, 94% of patients from that registry who developed a fungal brain abscess ultimately died because of it. As expected, the majority of those patients had more disseminated evidence of a fungal infection, lung or other organ involvement, or they had multifocal brain abscesses, all of which likely contributed to the high mortality rate. It is a rare condition, fungal brain infections, but the incidence is on the rise. We have HIV and organ transplantation to thank for this. But our treatments for these and for other CNS infections also continues to improve. I said we don't have a lot of antifungal agents available right now, but there are a few in the pipeline. Importantly, earlier and more rapid identification of fungal brain infections should lead to earlier and more targeted treatment. And that wraps it up for the show this week. I hope you were able to take something away from what we covered in the program. And if you liked it, I'm always happy to hear some feedback. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio or find us on Facebook or message us directly at bweditorialboard at gmail.com. If you haven't already rated the show, please do so. We can always use a few more stars to bring us up in the iTunes ratings so that other people who like neuroscience and medicine and history can find the show and they can subscribe. Really appreciate your support with this. The Brainwaves Podcast is produced out of Studio 3 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Jim Siegler, Senior Producer. Music for the program this week was courtesy of Jazar Swelling, The Insider, and Chris Zabriskie under a Creative Commons license. Sound effects by Mike Koenig and Daniel Simeon. I'm Jim Siegler from Philadelphia. Thanks for listening.